Uh, okay, I'm going to turn things over to Ed Walsh, who's going to introduce our speaker and tell us about next month's meeting. First. All right. Okay, we've got uh, we've got a real treat tonight, uh, especially for the eclipse chasers among us. <clears throat> uh, tonight, Joe Rayo will be uh, who has at least four continents worth of experience uh, <laughs> chasing solar eclipses. Uh, will be talking about uh, talking about his experiences. Uh, for over 21 years, he was the chief meteorologist and science editor at News 12 in Westchester. Uh, he's been nominated for several Emmy Awards and in 2015 was voted first among weathercasters in New York State by the Associated Press. Uh, since the 80s, he's also served as an associate and guest lecturer at one of my favorite places, uh, the Hayden Planetarium. Uh, he is, among other things, consulting editor for Sky and Telescope magazine and writes a syndicated weekly column uh, for the online news service space.com. So without further ado, uh, let's hear about the adventures of an eclipse chaser. Take it away, Joe. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ed, and uh, good afternoon or good evening to all of you. Um, I want to first stress that this particular talk is going to have nothing to do or nothing to say concerning the upcoming total eclipse of the sun in 2024. In fact, it'll be exactly 16 months from tomorrow that that grandiose event is going to take place. So if you're looking for a slide presentation about weather prospects or about where is the best place to see it and how to view it and whatever, you're not going to find it here tonight. However, uh, a while back, I began to think about all the eclipses that I've been observing, and I came to the sudden realization that this year, 2023, will mark 60, ooh, that hurts, 60 years since I first got hooked on eclipses, and I thought maybe it might be worthwhile to uh, do a presentation about all of the eclipses that I have seen and all of the crazy stuff that has occurred from one eclipse to another, and I think that this will be, uh, if not an entertaining, at least an informative uh, talk for all of you. And for those of you who have never seen a total eclipse of the sun before, I am hoping that before this night is out, after seeing uh, this presentation, that you will say, yes, yes, damn it, I'm going in 16 months to that eclipse in 2024. And away we go with adventures of an eclipse chaser by yours truly. <laughs> now, this presentation begins with these two people who are very near and dear to me. This is my grandmother and grandfather, my, uh, my mother's parents. Uh, when I was a very young boy, my sister and I, and my mom, uh, my mom had a, uh, had a divorce in the uh, earlier mid 1960s. And so uh, she, went to her parents and we moved in with my grandmother and grandfather. I'm not sure how many uh, people, uh, you know, there may be other parents out there who said, no, no, you're not gonna move in with us. You know, you'll find your own place and you know, you'll find somebody to watch the kids. We've, we've done our time with you and your brother, my uncle Ron. But no, my grandmother and my grandfather were very gracious, took us in and basically, uh, my grandfather became my surrogate father. Uh, he was the guy who um, helped put me in, you know, little league, and uh, he uh, watched over uh, watched over me and uh, and my sister. And he was a very interesting guy. He uh, he was an immigrant from Italy. He came from a little town uh, just outside of Naples, and came to America when he was two years old. He and his parents moved to Brooklyn, and there is where it all begins. The, uh, the uh, beginning of my interest in astronomy and especially my interest in uh, solar eclipses. This is yours truly when he was rather young. Get a look, get a look at that jalopy in the background there <laughs> to, get, to get an idea. But one summer afternoon in July of 1963, my grandfather uh, pulled me aside in the kitchen and said, guess what? This afternoon, we're going to have an eclipse. And I said, of course, uh, being not quite seven years old, well, what's an eclipse? And he took the salt and pepper shaker down from off of the kitchen shelf, made a fist, 
And he said that today, later today, the sun, the moon, and the earth are all going to set itself up in a straight line. He said, consider my fist to be the sun, the salt shaker of the moon, and the pepper shaker of the earth. So the moon is going to come along and block out the sun for us. And uh, of course, I was a wise guy, a little wise guy, even at that age. <laughs> and I looked at my grandfather, I said, Peepa, which is what I called him when I was very young. I said, Peepa, that can't be the sun. And he said, what do you mean? He said, well, the sun doesn't have knuckles. But in any case, uh, that afternoon, New York, we lived in the Bronx back then, was to uh, see a partial eclipse of the sun. And here you see the uh, stages of the eclipse. The eclipse begins at 441. This was on the afternoon of Saturday, July 20th, 1963. Maximum eclipse, 89% of the sun's diameter would be covered at 549 and then the eclipse would come to an end at 650 p.m. Now, I don't know about any of you who might have, you know, go back that far, but I honestly and truly believe that it was a completely different era, completely different society back then. Today, the average kid, if you I think told him about an eclipse, he'd say, "Oh, that's interesting. No oh, big deal." You know, they then they usually would play with their iPhones. That's what they do now, but the kids back in night, it was a kinder and gentler time. And the kids I know got very interested and really excited. And so did a lot of other people. Uh, this was not something that came along every day of the week, uh, an eclipse of the sun. And so a lot of people uh, prepared for it and looked at it uh, either through projection or with uh, special filtration. We in the Bronx during the eclipse, we had a lot of clouds in the sky, a lot of clouds only got fitful glimpses of the, of the eclipse through the clouds. However, I do remember this. My grandmother had her kitchen radio on the porch where we were watching. And apparently when the eclipse was reaching totality uh, to our north, up in New England or up in Quebec, Canada, somebody who was giving the blow by blow said, wow, look at that, that's unbelievable. And at that moment, I swear to you, the clouds thinned, and this, what you're seeing on the screen now, is what was suddenly available to us, a crescent sun in the sky. And uh, it, it was an amazing sight to me to see that. Uh, and, and of course, because of the movement of the clouds, it almost looked like the sun or the crescent sun was moving rapidly through the clouds, but I was just blown away by that sight. And again, it happened just as this guy on the radio said, oh my goodness, look at that. Anyway, after the eclipse was over, it was time for dinner, and I just couldn't, I was, as my grandmother would call me, a little chatterbox. I was asking questions to my grandfather. I said, wow, that's really something. That's amazing. Blah, 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 blah. And my grandfather looked at my grandmother and my mom and said, you know, I made a big mistake today. And that mistake was I didn't take, take this kid up to Maine. Because Maine in 1963, July uh, 20th, the path of totality came across one state in the Union that year, and that was Maine. And there you see the path as it cut literally Maine in half. And it was, it was, it was a great thing to see back then. This is a photograph, a composite photograph taken from the tallest or highest uh, geographical location along the Atlantic seaboard. That was Cadillac Mountain in Maine. And you could see how the sun moved slowly into uh, the grips of the moon, here's totality, and then after totality, which I believe lasted about a minute, the moon moved on its merry way and uh, the eclipse ended. And I said to my grandfather, I said, Grandpa, uh, uh, Peepa, when, when will we be able to see a total eclipse from here in New York? Well, <laughs> he was at that last total eclipse of the sun in New York in January of 1925, front page of the New York Times, an amazing thing. If you ever get a chance to read the uh, New York Times uh, on microfilm or go back in time, first five pages of the New York Times covered with eclipse information in the aftermath, spectacular view. My grandparents, my, gra my grandfather lived with his parents in Brooklyn. Well, that was not too good because Brooklyn was not in the path of totality. You had to go north of 96th Street in 1925 to see a total eclipse of the sun. And so my grandfather told me that my great-grandfather, uh, his father Pasquale, woke him up first thing in the morning 
and said, get bundled up. We're going on the, IR, the, the IND train. We're going north to a place you've never been to before, a strange and exotic place. And my grandfather, who at the time was 16 years old, said, Papa, where are we going? And my great grandfather said, to the Bronx. And that's where they saw the total eclipse. This is a view. This picture was taken from Pelham Bay Park in the Bronx of totality. And it was a spectacle. Well, I mean, you saw in the New York Times, everybody just stopped everything to look at this amazing sight in the sky. So I asked him, okay, well, he said, well, the next one is not going to be in New York for a long time. Well, it's the next one that we'd be able to go visit like, like this one. And my grandfather really didn't know. My grandfather figured, well, they made a big fuss about the 1925 eclipse and the one in 63 they made a big fuss about. That was almost 40 years. So he figured, well, the next one, the next chance of another one like this won't come for many, many, many years. He said, you're probably going to be all grown up by the time you'll get a chance to see one uh, nearby to where we live. But then the next day, next morning, in fact, my grandfather came into my bedroom and I had a calendar on the wall. Uh, this was one of those calendars where you can move the, the dates around uh, and the, the months. And he looked at the calendar, he looked at me and he said, make a date. He said, March 7th, 1970. And I said, what's, what's going to happen then? He says, the next chance we're going to have to see a total eclipse and we're going, we're going to go. And here's the path of totality of that 1970 eclipse, starting in the Pacific Ocean, moving across Mexico, and then up along the Atlantic seaboard. My grandfather was eyeing the fact that the eclipse would be visible from Florida. And to him, going to Florida in late winter sounded like a great heck of a chance for a nice vacation. And why not bring the grandkid along so that we can see a total eclipse of the sun? And every year from 1963 on, at the stroke of midnight, we'd, we'd watch the ball drop in Times Square. And after we watched the ball drop and we wished each other a happy new year, every year after that moment, I'd turn to my grandfather and say, one more year closer to the eclipse, one more year to go. And we were, were another year closer to the, to the big event. And that was like a tradition. And over the time frame from 63 to 1970, I got more and more interested in astronomy, got my first telescope. In fact, in 1970, uh, there was a science fair. The science fair was held by the New York Daily News. It was a citywide science fair. I entered it, and I, uh, my, my, my science project was about the solar eclipse that was coming up. And guess what? I won first prize in the Bronx. I was the Bronx Borough finalist, and I won first prize. This shocked my mother. Not that she didn't believe that I, I knew a lot of stuff about astronomy. But there were so many other projects there that looked so much better than mine. One kid had a, had a, a, a model of an oscilloscope, a working oscilloscope, which he or maybe he and his father built. I don't know. And when I won, one of the judges came by, shook my hand and said, congratulations. And my mother asked the judge, he said, can I ask a question? He said, why did he win when there's so many other projects here that look so much better? And the judge said to my mother, he said it was the passion. Not only did he know everything there was about an eclipse, but he also told us the story that he was going to go see the eclipse later this year in March with his grandfather. It was going to be his first total eclipse of the sun. And he was so excited. And the excitement just spilled over to us. And we, we figured this was, this was the one who would win the science fair. Well, unfortunately, and so, uh, somebody told me this many years later, he said, you got to understand you think that your life is all planned out for you. You think that your life is like a, like a script written out, but life does rewrites. And uh, early in 1970, my grandfather, who worked as a dispatcher for the MTA, uh, he worked with the buses and he was constantly down where the buses were. And I guess he was uh, uh, taking in a lot of the fumes from the buses. He was also, uh, a, a big cigarette smoker. He smoked Kent. You remember Kent with the Micronite filter, which I think later on they discovered was actually made of uh, asbestos or something like that. Anyway, he used to smoke like three or four packs a day. He suddenly came down with a raspy voice in January or early February of that year. So his doctors sent him to an eye, ear, uh, nose, and throat specialist. The specialist looked at him and said, I think we ought to have you go to the hospital to check this out. They did. And they found that 
cancer had developed on his larynx, on his voice box. And they said to him, Mr. Balzano, you have one of two choices. You either get the uh, voice box with the cancer removed, or if you keep it the way it is, you're eventually going to die. So unfortunately, uh, he had to have his voice box removed at St. Vincent's Hospital in Manhattan. And the day of the operation was March the 6th, the day before the big eclipse. So once again, as was the case in 1963, I uh, had to see a partial eclipse. But this time, instead of 89%, I was going to see 96% of the sun covered, almost the total eclipse. Here's a picture I took outside in front of my house just before the eclipse began. And here's how it looked uh, during the maximum stage of the eclipse. You can see a, like an eerie twilight, as the New York Times said the day after, an eerie twilight fell briefly over the New York City area as we missed out on uh, a total eclipse. There you see how the crescent swung around as it reached its peak, its maximum of 96%. Uh, right after the eclipse, we all uh, went down to see my grandfather in the hospital. He uh, was able to communicate by using a chalkboard. And when I came into his hospital room, uh, he, he knew I was gonna be very, very disappointed. So he wrote on the chalkboard, when's the next one? And I knew, and, and he knew when, and I knew when the next one was, since I knew a lot about astronomy back then and today. And I told him, I said, well, the next one is going to be in 1972, July 10th, uh, a Monday. The path of the eclipse would run from Alaska across Northern Canada, but as it moved out over the ocean, it was gonna go across the maritime provinces just to the north of Maine. I said, that's not really all that far, is it? And he just looked at me and he wrote on the chalkboard, we're going. And that's no question about it. We're gonna go to see that eclipse. That's a promise. Well, the eclipse uh, approached. My grandfather, by the way, learned how to speak. I know that you've probably seen on television people who had their uh, voice box removed. They had this little device, they put it up to their throat and they sound like this like a robot, but my grandfather never went with one of those. He actually learned how to speak by belching, bringing his air up through his diaphragm and belching words out. He sounded very much like Popeye. I, I have to tell you, we're gonna go, yeah, yeah, you know, that kind of thing. So you were able to understand what he said. And I certainly understood this message on the chalkboard that we're gonna go to the 1972 eclipse. Here is how the path of totality moved across the Maritimes of Canada. And we had decided, or at least I had decided, based upon best weather prospects, that we were going to go to the town of Cap Chat in, uh, on the Gaspé Peninsula in northern Quebec. Now, I must tell you that Cap Chat, if you want to visualize what kind of a town it was, uh, watch the Andy Griffith Show and Mayberry. Cap Chat was Mayberry in Francophone French. Really, I, when, we got, when we were driving through Cap Chat, uh, and it was a leisurely 900 mile trip. We made one stop in Montreal and then the next day we stopped in Quebec City. And then on the morning of the 10th, we drove up along the St. Lawrence River uh, Highway to get us up to Cap Chat. And I could, I could swear to you that there were 2,500 people populating Cap Chat, but there must have been 10 times that many people who converged on Cap Chat for the solar eclipse. Here's a view of Grandpa and my grandmother, you could see how happy she was to be there. <laughs> uh, I have to tell you that my grandmother, if you've ever saw the movie Pride of the Yankees with Gary Cooper, my grandmother reminded me very much of Ma Garrick. You remember in the movie Pride of the Yankees, um, Mrs. Garrick really didn't care for baseball, couldn't understand why people would even go to a baseball game. But when Lou Garrick made the Yankees, he, uh, 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 his, uh, his mother and father, went to Yankee Stadium, but they, they arrived just as the stadium opened. So when they went in, there was nobody in the ballpark. And, my, uh, and, and Mrs. Garrick says to her husband, are you sure we're in the right ballpark? Two hours later, when the ballpark was jam packed to capacity with people, she kept looking around because she didn't understand baseball. And she felt it was like, you know, uh, senseless to go watch a bunch of people running around and play a ball game for a couple of hours. So she looked around the big crowd and he said, I don't believe it. All these people with nothing to do. Well, during this eclipse, my grandmother 
was sitting in the front seat of the car as we were driving up the St. Lawrence uh, Seaway for totality that day, and we didn't encounter anybody on the roads. The roads were barren. Well, of course they were, because everybody was already in place at various locations in the path of totality. We were coming up that morning, and she, she said to me, he said, are you sure you have the right day for this, this thing that we're all supposed to see? And when we, when we got into the totality path, right at the edge of totality, we saw a guy with his telescope along the side of the road. And my grandmother said, why aren't we stopping here? There's another idiot. But as we continued up and got deeper and deeper into the totality path, more and more and more people uh, began to uh, increase until finally when we got to, to the town, when we got to the city, and I swear to you, I could have sworn that I saw a French version of Barney Fife trying to direct traffic. My grandmother's looking around at all these people on the roads and all over the place, and she's saying, I don't believe this. All these people here to see it get dark for two minutes. I don't understand any of this. But it was my grandmother who saved the day for us. We, we were going to stay in a hotel, the Hotel Minuet, and when she found out that we were going to have to share the bathroom with other people on the same floor, it was not the best hotel, but it was the only one I could get uh, for a room. She said, we're not staying here. I, all over my dead body, we're staying here. So my grandfather said, all right, we'll see the eclipse, and then we'll drive back four hours to Quebec City and, get, and get a, go back to the hotel in Quebec City, which was okay with her. But, but because of that, she saved the day. You see, Capshat was clouded out of the eclipse. Here is a sequence view, and this sequence was taken by somebody who was gonna become very, very close to me, very good friends of, uh, uh, with me, and that person was Glenn Schneider. I didn't know Glenn in 1972, but he happened to be, we figure, about 600 yards to the southwest of where we were. We set up outside of town to watch the eclipse, and these pictures were taken by Glenn. You can see first contact. But notice also that as the eclipse progressed, there were clouds, more and more clouds covering the sun. And finally, this view in the lower right was Glenn's last view of the sun before totality arrived. He got to see a 99% crescent, then the clouds rolled in and over him, and he did not see totality. Missed totality completely because of the clouds. However, where we happen to be, ho ho, look at this, 30 seconds into totality, the corona, the sun popped into view, and we got a chance to see the total eclipse, whereas everybody in town and Glenn, they got wiped out. But where we happen to be, where we just happen to be fortuitously set up, we were able to see at least two minutes out of the two minutes and 30 seconds of total eclipse from uh, the area around Capshack. We, as I said, I didn't know Glenn Schneider then, but I would know him or learn about him uh, within a year. Here's a picture of a very happy 16-year-old, same age that my grandfather was when he saw his first eclipse. Here I am, big smile on my face. We had just seen, and I had just seen, my very first total solar eclipse. As for Glenn, well, he and I, here, am, here's, here I am, and here's Glenn, uh, we became close friends because we ended up as volunteers at the Hall of Science in Flushing Meadow, Queens, one of the old exhibits of the 1964 World's Fair. They left a few exhibits standing. Hall of Science was one of them. And in the Hall of Science, there was a planetarium. And Glenn and I used to spend our weekends as volunteers at the Hall of Science planetarium. And from there, we got to know each other very well. There was also an astronomy club there the Amateur Observer Society of New York. And so Glenn was the president. I would later succeed him as president. And in 1977, Glenn came up to me and said, I wonder, I want to bounce an idea off of you. I said, sure, what? He said, how would you like to go see the total eclipse of the sun coming up in October? And that eclipse was going to pass over Colombia, South America. I said, sure, what's your plan? He said, you and I run a trip. We'll run a trip and we'll say that, uh, you know, we, that we'll, we're the eclipse experts and we'll, uh, whoever comes on board and we'll, we'll go down to South America. What, what, what problem would there be? It may be a different country, but, you know, we're going to see a total eclipse of the sun. 
and uh, somehow or other, I agreed with him. And here was the ad that we had in Sky and Telescope magazine uh, using the Amateur Observer Society as our front. <laughs> and Glenn's parents uh, would, would act as uh, travel agents uh, that we had Eclipse 77. And believe it or not, we had ended up uh, coercing or cajoling 20 people to come from all different parts of the country uh, to join us on this eclipse expedition. And here we are. Here we are. Uh, we, were, we were tykes. We were tiny tykes. We were both 21 years old. And, we were, and you, you should have seen the look on some of the people on our tour when, when we met up with them. <laughs> I mean, some people were in their 40s or 50s or 60s, and they looked at us and said, "This, these two guys, they're the ones who are going to be our eclipse leaders to uh, South America. And uh, I have to tell you, looking at this picture, I probably would have felt the same way. But uh, like I said, we, we felt that this was not going to be any, any problem. Uh, but then problems began to appear. Example, this was our bus. And uh, we, we, we looked around, we found an agency to charter a bus. So this was our bus. Uh, 300 meters from our hotel, our bus broke down minutes after we boarded it. Uh, the odometer read zero, 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 one. Now I can assure you that this bus was hardly new. Several people decided to walk to the National Museum, which was less than a half a kilometer away. When they arrived at what was supposed to be one of the key must-see sites in town, they were advised that it was closed. When they asked when it would be reopened, they were told, Proximo Año, next year. We were going to head to an eclipse site uh, on the center line and in uh, north of the capital city of Bogota. And to get there, we would have to go through a little town called Subachoque. The trip to Subachoque was a little over one hour. We stopped there for lunch, ended up drawing quite a crowd. People from all over town came to ask questions about the eclipse and to see this strange group who had come from the United States to see this event. Now, we had taken the opportunity to distribute solar filters to people in town to view the partial phases. Our bus was surrounded by those asking for filters. Nearly 100 were given out in less than 10 minutes. But at this time, most of our eyes were now trained on the sky as some rather ominous clouds were beginning to drift in front of the sun. And that is when the real trouble started. The road conditions deteriorated rapidly. Now, this was unexpected. Our driver, Tomas, remembered that the road was well kept. We later found out that this was a half a dozen years earlier. Now it was hardly traveled at all. In attempting to surmount the one large unavoidable pothole in the unpaved roadway, the bus became stuck in the hole. And just at this time, we encountered a very heavy tropical shower. And the road turned into a quagmire. After an hour of struggling with everybody pushing the bus, we managed to get it free. Still raining, we inspected the road ahead by foot and determined that it should be that it would be quite impassable. We couldn't stay where we were as the mountains to the west would block our view of the sun. We couldn't go forward as the road was un untravelable. So Tomas assured us we, we, we cannot go back down the way we came. So the bus would have to be turned around. The road at this point was less than half a meter wider than the length of the bus and dropped off sharply into two muddy ravines. Turning the bus proved to be no simple task and the slippery road conditions only compounded the problem. But now it was an hour to go to first contact and a new site had to be chosen immediately. So we chose a large valley to the north of the little community of El Rosal. This would take us off center line, but would still allow us 38 seconds of totality. In addition, a new paved road could be traveled all the way. 20 minutes later, we were at an observing site and began setting up our equipment. We had descended considerably in altitude since leaving Subachoque, and with the mountains to the east of us, the western sky was quite clear. Now, when we first arrived, as you can see, there was just one little hole, blue spot, blue patch in the clouds. Uh, that was the clear spot. But over the course of the next hour or so, that little spot, that little area, that little patch began to grow. And soon we were encountering clearer and clearer skies. And uh, no sooner did our bus stop than cars along the road started slowing down and stopping. And it was a chain reaction. 
within a half an hour, over 300 people had joined us at our site. And here you see Glenn here projecting the image of the sun. It had become quite clear at that particular point. Uh, we, we were hampered by clouds until a few minutes after first contact. Then the last of the clouds began to clear away. Now from here, it looked as though the eclipse was in the bag with unobstructed viewing in the western sky. During the partial phase, as the tension was mounting at our site, the locals who had joined us were becoming just as excited as we were at the prospect of what was to come. But the sky of totality was about 90% clear. 90% clear, except that the 10% that wasn't clear was one lowly cloud, which like the Goodyear blimp, drifted in front of the sun just as totality arrived. Ah! Missed it by that much. One miserable cloud with hydro, hydrogen alpha linings still taunts, at least me, uh, in, in, in silent mockery just thinking about it. Clear skies loomed only a few degrees away from the cloud. So near and yet so far. The sun, hidden from our view during totality, broke through the cloud into the surrounding blue sky about five minutes after totality and remained visible most of the time until sunset. The sky had then been almost completely blue except for a few isolated spots near the horizon. And then to add insult to our injury, sunset was rather spectacular. The partially eclipsed sun set over the distant mountains. In setting, the sun passed behind a water tower on the foreground hills and gave us a very interesting parting view. But we missed totality and that, that was it. We they really, we were not a very happy bunch of people going back uh, to uh, our hotel and heading back home to the United States. And you see the sun setting behind that water tower. Well, we weren't gonna let that stop us. Some weeks afterwards, when uh, after we licked our wounds, Glenn said to me, we can't let it go like this. The next eclipse is going to be in February of 1979, right here in the United States. And so we mounted another expedition, which we called Blackout 79. And Glenn left it up to me to figure out where we were going to go. Here was the totality path. This one started again in the Pacific, went across Washington and Oregon, through Hi, yeah. North Just wondering North, if you're doing anything and then all the way up morning, through Canada, not, and not all the way up into the right up. Maybe go get breakfast, maybe go to And the, here was uh, a close-up of the eclipse basketball path. game. Maybe and, go around. Uh, I think I hear somebody in the background. If so, if you if you could mute yourself, because that kind of throwing throwing me off here, uh, the extraneous uh, noise. This close-up view of the totality path, and we had decided based upon weather prospects, the best climatological conditions, that we were going to go to Lewistown, Montana, which also happened to be the center, the geographic center of the state of Montana. Montana is a pretty pretty big state, but as you can see. The eclipse path, which was 190 miles wide, covered almost the entire state of Montana. So we all headed for Lewistown for this eclipse. And about a year before the eclipse, when we had decided, we at the Amateur Observance Society, that we were going to have another eclipse trip and we were going to head to Lewistown, we actually sent a copy of our newsletter with everything about the eclipse to Lewistown to the local newspaper there, the Lewistown News Argus. And we told them that we had declared Lewistown, Montana is the eclipse capital of the world. And we made the front page of the Lewistown newspaper. Called world's eclipse capital, eclipse viewers focus on Lewistown. And that is where we headed and that is where we were uh, for the couple of days before the eclipse. We arrived there on uh, February uh, the 23rd and stayed through the 27th. And one thing, if any of you are going to the eclipse in 2024 and you want to know the best weather forecast or the best latest weather information, get chummy with the local National Weather Service office. That's what we did. Uh, prior to the eclipse for many weeks before, I contacted the weather service in Great Falls, Montana, and got to know the MIC, the meteorologist in charge, Dr. William Raymer, here he is. Uh, I look at this picture now. I th back then in 1979, this was 
advanced technology. I mean, I, this was state of the art. Today, this looks so antiquated as compared to what is available in our technology today. Here you see me and right next to me is Keith Eichner, who is another meteorologist who did the weather in uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis. You'll, you'll hear Keith in a, little in a little bit. And, you know, I got my start doing television weather uh, in Long Island in 1988 i used to i was a stringer i was one of those guys who filled in and when the regular weather guy uh, at news 12 long island uh was not available i would fill in but you know what i really got my start in television in great falls montana lewistown montana in 1979 the night before the eclipse complete with the latest weather data being fed to us by the national weather service uh, great falls actually had a program where they were giving latest updates on the eclipse here you can see uh, from one of the local stations, somebody holding the microphone. And I did a weather forecast live on television in Montana for the, uh, for the eclipse. This was on a blackboard. Quality Seed was the Quality Seed factory where our group of about 80 was to see the solar eclipse. Big, wide open field. Well, unfortunately, just a few hours before the eclipse, the latest information from the Weather Service indicated that high and mid-level clouds were approaching from the west. And so I showed that to Glenn, and that was his girlfriend at the time, Susan Howard. And I said, you know, we really don't want this to happen to us again. I think we ought to make a move. We ought to get everybody at, at, at the crack of dawn on the bus or buses. We had two of them and head out east of where Lewistown is to try to see the eclipse. And Glenn agreed. Here was our buses. You can see they were much, much better than what we had in South America. Two chartered buses, people got on board, and off we headed to uh, on, on route, US Route 200 to the east to try to uh, outrace the clouds and try to see the eclipse. The, the, the funny thing is, there really wasn't any place along the road where we could set up until about an hour after we left, we came across this place, a big farmhouse and barn uh, located alongside the road. And uh, we stopped the two buses. Glenn and I got out and we walked from the buses and knocked on the door, the front door of this guy's house, because we wanted to know if we could set up on his land. This obviously is a large field here, probably belonged to him. And we didn't just want to arbitrarily set up without getting permission. So we knocked on the door. And the door opened, and the guy who opened the door looked just, he was like the spitting image of Joseph Kearns. He was the actor who played Mr. Wilson on the old Dennis the Menace TV show. Looked just like him. And I let Glenn do all the talking. He said, excuse me, sir, uh, we're from New York. He showed us the two buses. And he says, and we're here to see the uh, eclipse, which is going to happen very, very soon. We want to know if we could set our equipment up on your land. And Mr. Wilson <laughs> broke into a big smile and he said, really? He said, so you people came from New York and you're here to see the eclipse? He said, well, he said, it'd be a different story for June or July, but right now the only thing I'm raising out there is snow, grass, and sagebrush. Go ahead, go ahead, be my guest. And Glenn turned and he gave the thumbs up sign. I, I don't know why, but I gave the same signal that the umpire would give if somebody hit a home run. I started waving my hand in a circle and immediately you never saw 80 people come piling out of two buses so fast and running and uh setting up to watch the eclipse now it wasn't really overly cold it was only about 35 or 34 degrees but we're setting up to watch the eclipse and here i am all happy with my welder's glass uh, in place watching and now what you're about to see and hear are just snippets snippets the sights and sounds of the solar eclipse of February 26, 1979. And it's getting spooky. It does look like a storm gathering now off to the west. I got a microphone here if you want it. Here we are. 
One percent before totality now. One minute before totality or less. Got it? Okay. Oh, oh, this is unbelievable. Oh, my God, I believe this. This is unreal. Look at this. We've got family speed. Oh, yeah, we got it. Oh, that's beautiful. Look at the color of the fire. You can see that the shadow is elliptical shape. I forgot to start. Don't worry about it. Shit, I forgot to start fire. Oh, look at the time minutes. Anybody with binoculars? They're absolutely fantastic. Look at the red. All around. Look at the red. Oh, my God. Look at the red. Oh, wow. Oh, it's soaking. I can't believe we're coming out of it now. We're beginning to come out of it. Oh, wow. 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 Oh, Yes, three cheers for the eclipse. <laughs> and uh, everybody was jumping up and down and hugging each other. And the two, two friends of mine, George Lamaga and Tom Carey, lifted me up and, and you know, started, you know, walking me up and down or whatever, like I was the conquering hero. But it was a great time. We, we really had a great uh, a view of uh, the eclipse. And it was just absolutely wonderful. That was 1979. And I would go now through the entire decade of the 80s without going after or chasing a total eclipse. And there was good reason for that. You see, I met a very lovely young lady uh, at the weather office where I worked and uh, we got married. And uh, a bit later after that, we bought ourselves a house. I, these are all expenditures. I mean, you, you can't chase eclipses around the world without having some money in your pockets. And indeed all of this, you know, you had to figure, you know, well, I got to buy the house. I got and we all going to be taking care of a family uh, toward the end of the decade. We found out that uh, Renata was pregnant and we're, we were going to have our first child. So we had to pass on all the eclipses in the 1980s. But in 1990, I said, it's time. It's time to go, go out and pursue an eclipse again. This was in the July 1990 uh, issue of Sky and Telescope, this comment about the eclipse that month. Elusive, fog and low clouds, a major obstacle. The best bet would be to observe the eclipse from an aircraft. And then they showed a map in that issue talking about the fact that most of the United States would miss the eclipse. But if you lived out in the western part of the country, you'd be able to catch the closing stages of the partial eclipse right around sunset. And maybe some people might have thought, oh, well, maybe we should go out west and see that. My mind didn't work that way. I looked at this map. And I said to myself, well, wait a minute, here's the totality path that cut through the Aleutian Islands and would come on down and come to an end in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. But I said, you know, it's interesting. Here's San Francisco and here's Honolulu. And the eclipse is more or less in between both of those cities. What if there was some kind of an aircraft, maybe a commercial jet airliner that was flying either to Honolulu or maybe from Honolulu to San Francisco and maybe possibly could encounter the shadow and get a chance to see the total eclipse. Well, remember this is 1990 and Al Gore hadn't yet uh, invented the internet. So what I had to do was I had to go to my local Levittown library and pull out a copy of the OAG, the official airline guide. This was a, uh, a book which pretty much was similar to the uh, New York or Manhattan phone directory. And in this book, there was a schedule giving you an idea of all the flights going from one city to another all over the world. 
I mean, for example, if you want to know, uh, uh, take a flight from London to Moscow, this book would tell you what flights were available and what times were available. And so I spent a couple of hours with this book at the Levittown Library looking for some airline or airlines that might possibly be in position to see that July 1970 solar eclipse. And guess what? I found one. It doesn't exist anymore, but at the time, it was American Trans Air, which flew a flight from San Francisco to Honolulu, and then from Honolulu back to San Francisco. Flight 403 would take us from San Francisco to Hawaii. Flight 402 would take us from Hawaii over to San Francisco, and that was the flight. I had figured out that if there's some way that I could coerce American Trans Air to delay that flight for 41 minutes, we would be in position to see the total eclipse over the Pacific Ocean. You got to have somebody who is in your camp. I got on the phone. I explained it to the head of flight services at American Trans Air, a gentleman by the name of Mark DeHorty. DeHorty sounded interested. He said, I'll get back to you. Uh, I'm going to tell the hierarchy here, and we'll see what happens. Well, two days later, Mark called back. He said, I've got you on a conference call. I have the head of the airline, uh, John Zetzman, with me, and we also have several other people from the airline. Now, explain to us why you think it might be worthwhile to delay this flight by 41 minutes. Well, for the next 10 minutes, I went into this, this monologue about how great solar eclipses are and how you have to see one. And by the end of that 10 minute talk, I didn't have a dry eye in the house. They said, okay, we'll do it. We'll, we'll delay the flight. He said, are you planning to come on board? I said, of course. I said, I'll probably bring my wife along with me. And I said, I, maybe I know a few other people who might want to come too. Fine. He said, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be perfect. So that's what we did. We, uh, my wife, uh, Renata, uh, and two other friends, Sam Storch and Craig Small. Craig, an eclipse chaser, has what he calls his lucky flag. He's taken this, this flag with him on every eclipse that he has gone to. And he's gone to over 30 of them. And each time he has seen totality. That is his lucky flag. And there you see the flag. Here's uh, Craig. Here's Sam, and here's my wife, uh, Renata. Uh, by the way, Renata was six months pregnant with our first child, our son, Joseph. Um, I told my son, who now teaches physics in uh, one of the local high schools, I said, so that was your first eclipse. And my son, Joseph, said to me, he said, I don't remember seeing that eclipse. And I said, oh, that's right. You didn't have a womb with a view. Anyway, here we are. And although the airline said that the flight was leaving at 3.20, little did anybody know who was taking that flight back to San Francisco, because we had flown from New York to San Francisco. Then the next morning after we left our hotel, went on board flight 403, flew to Hawaii. We were in Hawaii for exactly 45 minutes in Honolulu. I turned to Renan and I said, now don't never say I never take you anywhere. Back on the plane, back on flight 402, and uh, we told everybody en route to San Francisco about why the flight was being delayed by 41 minutes. It's a big plane. This was a Boeing L, this was an L-1011 jet with 360 people. And all of these people, at least the people who were on the side of the plane facing the sun, would get a chance to see the eclipse. And we actually handed out filters and flyers. And I gave a little explanation on, on the PA about what was going to happen, what was going to transpire. This was pre 9-11. 9-11, of course, would be 11 years in the future. This is Captain Bob Leary uh, of our flight. And it was a good thing that I had access. It's a good thing that you know a passenger could just arbitrarily just go into the cockpit and uh, chat with the pilots. Right after we took off, I, I uh, went into the, uh, into the uh, flight deck. And among all the things that were on the dashboard, uh, for the uh, for the uh, aircraft, I saw one LED that said 413. Now I had told uh, American Trans Air that we need to position the plane uh, at the point inside of the totality path and needed to be there at 411 coordinated universal time. And I saw on the dashboard or on the uh, instrumentation panel 413. So I asked Captain Leary, I said, uh, what, what's that? He says, oh, uh, a Continental Airlines flight 
got ahead of us and delayed us by a couple of minutes. He said, so we're going to be where you want us, want us to put the plane for the eclipse a couple of minutes later at 413. That'll be okay, won't it? And I said, no, it won't. I said, he said, what's wrong? He said, well, if we get there at 413, the shadow will have already gone by. We'll miss totality. We won't see the total, total phase at all. And he must have saw my face was like blanched at that point. And he said, oh, so what you're telling me is I have to figure out a way to make up two minutes. He said, yes, yes, can you? Can you make up two minutes and get us there at 411? And he said, oh, sure. He said, I'm a good old boy from Texas. I can make that up real easy. And he did. Uh, right after uh, that, uh, I guess he sped the plane up a little bit. And uh, uh, the uh, flight engineer, um, flight technician, the navigator, Frank Thomas, stuck his head out of the cockpit door, looked at me, and gave me the thumbs up sign, telling me, yeah, we're on target now. We're going to be there at 411. This video was taken by Sam. And uh, again, we were aiming for mid-eclipse, mid-totality at 411, with uh, totality starting 35 seconds earlier and ending 35 seconds later after 411. And uh, this, I, I have to apologize for what you're about to see, because this is what happens when you try to hold a bulky 1990 camcorder in one hand while trying to look through a pair of 11 by 80 Fujinons in the other. So that was Sam's view through his uh, camcorder. I had a Nicker Matte camera body with a 300 millimeter lens. And so this is one of the shots I got off. You could see some prominences. And this was right at the uh, third contact diamond ring event. And Craig, Craig took a picture uh, of the shadow. You could see how the shadow, the conical shape of the shadow, because we were very near sunset. And this is basically what it looks like. You could see bright sky. Uh, out ahead of the shadow, I'm trailing behind the shadow, and this was taken during the middle phase of the eclipse. I had promised American Trans Air that they would get good publicity. Here is the flight crew. This is Captain Bob again, Captain Bob Leary. Here's Frank Thomas and the uh, uh, flight attendants who were on board for that event. They were enthralled as well. We got the story published in the New York Times, and we also, I uh, was also able to write an article for Weatherwise magazine. It said it took a we went 11,000 miles over a span of 43 hours for the purpose of getting 73 seconds of total eclipse. And as I pointed out in the very first paragraph, uh, to any veteran eclipse chaser, it makes all the sense in the world. After that 1990 eclipse, we were waiting the following year for the big one, the one where the moon was going to be very near at uh, perigee at the same time that the sun was going to be 
at aphelion. So we had a small sun, a large moon, and a long eclipse, the longest for about the next 150 some odd years. Here's the totality path. Everybody was converging on Baja in uh, Mexico, where the eclipse would last on the order of as much as seven minutes, almost seven minutes. I, on the other hand, ended up not in Mexico, but all the way over here near the start of the eclipse track in Hawaii. I had seen in 1988 an ad in Better Homes and Garden for American Hawaii Cruises. And I wrote to American Hawaii Cruises in 1988 and said, hey, I don't know if you're aware of this, there's going to be a total eclipse of the sun over the big island of Hawaii. Maybe you ought to plan an eclipse cruise. And the response back was, well, that's, that's nice to know, but we, we, uh, we have the high season in July. That's when we usually sell out our, our ships and uh, we don't need an eclipse to sell anything out. So thank you very much. So I said, look, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll send you a copy of my book. I had written a book for Sky Publishing, the same people who published Sky and Telescope. I said, I'll send you a copy of my book. And uh, you, after you read it, maybe you'll find some interest. I, I sent them the book, never heard back, figured, okay, well, that's, that's that. Uh, you know, I have to think about another plan of observing the eclipse. One year later, I get a phone call from American Hawaii Cruises, and they said, we've, we've been getting phone calls from people asking us what we're planning to do for the eclipse. We told them the same thing we told you. Now we're not going to do anything. And now we're starting to get people yelling at us and, and, and chastising us, saying, what are you people crazy? What are they, this is the eclipse of the century, and you're not doing anything about it? So basically, we don't know anything about eclipses, and so we're calling you back. We've got your book. Can you help us? Can you help us put together an eclipse cruise? And I said, sure thing. They had offered not one, but two cabins. So my wife and I were in one cabin and my sister and my two brother-in-laws uh, were in the other cabin. I mean, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty, pretty darn good, isn't it? Uh, here is uh, one of the uh, advertisements for the eclipse and the eclipse cruise. Joe Rayo, meteorologist who will position the SS independence for the greatest possibility of seeing the spectacle. To me, this was, this was no problem, no problem whatsoever, because first of all, uh, as I said before, get in touch with the National Weather Service office in that area. This was in Honolulu and uh, spent time uh, there uh, looking over the facility. Here's Renata and I uh, with the MIC, meteorologist in charge in Honolulu, Hans Rosenthal, who was very, very nice. And Hans gave me the most valuable piece of equipment for this particular eclipse. He gave me his business card. I'll explain why that was so valuable in just a moment. The reason why everybody headed to Hawaii to see the eclipse, even though it was going to last three minutes shorter than Mexico, was that it was, it was, it was guaranteed to have great weather. Hawaii is, the big island is more or less a gigantic volcanic cone that juts up from the Pacific Ocean. And because of a phenomenon known as orographic lifting, when you have the winds moving up along the side of a mountain or a volcanic cone, the upslope effect causes clouds and also precipitation. But then as the air continues over the mountain and downslope, the air is dried out and warmed by compression effects. And so places that are on the lee side of the mountain would be able to see clear weather, clear skies. And since the Northeast trade winds blow 95% of the time in July, there was a 95% chance of clear weather. And tens of thousands of people went to the big island of Hawaii and headed for the west side of the island to see the total eclipse. Ah, uh, but as I said before, sometimes life does rewrites. One thing was that a month before the eclipse, Mount Penatubo in the Philippines blew, one of the biggest volcanic eruptions in the 20th century. That volcanic eruption put a tremendous aerosol cloud in the sky. And as a result, we had beautiful, gorgeous sunsets and sunrises. But also, the aerosol cloud meant that we were not going to have the clear tropical blue skies that we were promised. Instead, the skies would probably be a bit on the hazy side. Well, no problem, as long as we can see the sun, right? 
And here's the other problem that confronted us. We had a very rare atmospheric phenomenon known as a tut, a tropical upper tropospheric trough, which according to Hans, never happens in July. He said, I've never seen this event happen. And a tropical upper tropospheric trough usually translates into clouds and rain. And this was not what anybody was bargaining for in Hawaii, especially for the eclipse. And on the morning of the eclipse, uh, just a few hours before sunrise, it was drizzling on board the ship. And the, the computer information that I was working with and uh, was uh, using to try to forecast was totally, it was, it was, it was such that one time it said the, the, uh, the tut would be to the east of the island. And then another one would say it would be to the west. Another one would say it would be over the island. I had no clue what to do. No clue what to do. And I was really very, very worried. Um, I, you know, some people ask me, were you frightened? I mean, here you are, you're the meteorologist on board an eclipse cruise, and you're practically guaranteeing that everybody's going to see the eclipse. Were you frightened just a few hours before when you had the drizzle and the cloud cover? And I said, frightened? You're talking to a man who has laughed in the face of death, sneered at doom, and chuckled at catastrophe. I was petrified <laughs> and called the National Weather Service. I was almost like getting ready to slip my wrists and was getting a busy signal. Busy, busy, busy. And then I remembered the business card that Hans gave me. He said, here's my business card. And he wrote on the back of the card a phone number. He said, if you, we get, if you get busy signal, and there's going to be a lot of people calling, I'm sure, on the eclipse morning, call this number. This is my private number. And call this number, and I'll give you the very latest information. So I called. Hans immediately came on the phone. And I said, Hans, tell me, please, do you have any, any bit of hope? And he says, well, as it turns out, on the satellite pictures, we can see that there is a hole developing in the overcast. It's, it's developing rather nicely. He said, where are you? I said, we're off the Kona coast. He said, if you go 35 miles to the southwest, that's where the hole is developing. That could be your salvation. So I turned around to Captain Ha, H-A-U-G-H. And I said, Captain Ha, the weather service says that there's a hole developing in the clouds 35 miles to the southeast, the southwest of where we are. Captain Ha immediately barked out some command. The ship went 90, turned 90 degrees, and then suddenly went full bore at 27 knots, heading right toward that area. And amazingly, it looked like we were heading, you know, you ever been in a tunnel and you see the end of the tunnel ahead of you? It looked like we were heading toward the end of a tunnel. As, as with each passing minute, the, the hole in the cloud started to open up wider and wider and wider. And by the time the sun rose and, and got to daybreak, this is what we saw. Beautiful clear skies. That big head of hair belongs to my sister, Lisa. And we were also looking because off in the distance was the Constitution. The Constitution was the sister ship of the ship that we were on, the SS Independence. And when the end of independence got sold out, American Hawaii Cruises decided to bring the sister ship in and put the surplus or all the people who were on the waiting list on that ship. So we had not one, but two ships moving toward totality. And uh, we had radioed, Captain Hod radioed the Constitution and said, here, this is where we're headed. By the way, if you're an I Love Lucy fan, I should point out that um, this, if, if you remember the episode where Lucy, Ricky, Fred, and Ethel were going to Europe on board a ship, and Lucy missed the boat, and they had to drop her on board using a helicopter. Well, there you see the ship. The Constitution in the 1950s used to make European uh, cruises, and now it is uh, uh, making cruises around the Hawaiian Islands. But that was the ship on I Love Lucy. And my sister said to me later on, he said, would you have imagined in your wildest dreams that someday you'd be the guy who would be maneuvering that ship in order to see a total eclipse of the sun. Here's our ship. Everybody is on board, anxiously looking at the eclipse. Notice the clouds in the background. As I said, we were in a donut hole in the clouds. We had clouds all the way surrounding us during the uh, time of the eclipse. But fortunately, and this picture was taken by Renata, at totality, there you see the corona. There you see the cloud cover that unfortunately uh, skunked most of the people who went to 
the Big Island of Hawaii. They saw very little of it. We, on the other hand, lucked out and were able to see the corona high above that cloud cover. Here's a, a video of the last few moments before totality ended. Not so much the, uh, the view itself, because this was an old VHS tape, but just listen to the sights and sounds of people on board the cruise ship as we headed toward the end of totality. Captain Ha's voice in the background giving the play-by-play -play or blow-by-blow. <laughs> Okay, so this is actually This is garbage. So we had one bunch of happy people uh, for that for that eclipse. Um, for that event here is a close up view uh, of uh, the corona. Uh, the folks on Mauna Kea made a comment that this one prominence looked a big, about as big as a Buick. <laughs> And you could see how large that thing just rose off of the uh, disk of the sun. We were able to see that from the ship as well. Sadly, again, uh, we saw it, but many of the folks in on the big island uh, were skunked again by uh, cloud cover. Of course, after the eclipse, we had a little celebration on board, uh, on board the eclipse. There were other celebrities on board. The man on the left was Frederick Pohl, who's a very famous science fiction writer. In the middle here, you see George Keane, a very well-renowned uh, astrophotographer. His picture of the 1979 total eclipse appeared on the cover of Life magazine. And you already know who this guy is. But the one celebrity who really, I, I, I to this day, I, I still can't believe that I got a chance to be acquainted with him, was Mike Collins. Michael Collins, who uh, of course was the command module pilot on the first trip to the moon, to the lunar surface in eight, and, uh, with Apollo 11 in July of 1969. And uh, I had breakfast with Mike the day before the eclipse. And I, I wanted to ask him, I asked you know, so many things like uh, his uh, flight on Gemini uh, 8 where he uh, did a spacewalk and of course about Apollo 11, but he didn't seem to be interested. I guess he had answered these questions so many times. He, he wanted to know more about me. He, he was asking lots of questions about me, about uh, Renata, uh, about my uh, young son, uh, Joseph, and uh, my, my hopes and my dreams in the future. He, as much as Neil Armstrong was introverted, as much as Buzz Aldrin extroverted and appears on shows like Dancing with the Stars and whatever, Mike was just a normal, regular person. He was, he was a wonderful guy. It was my great honor and privilege to know him. And nobody, I think, was sadder than I was when I found out that he had passed away at the age, the ripe old age of 90, just about a year ago. Next eclipse coming up, 1998. But before that came along, uh, I had a chance to write a story in Reader's Digest about my grandfather and how he got me started in eclipses and how he got me started in science and, and, and weather. And uh, the name of the story that I wrote for Reader's Digest was called The Promise. And again, it told the story about uh, how uh, we saw that eclipse back in 1963. The 1998 eclipse, February of 1998, moved from the Pacific across Central America. And we were on a ship, it was called appropriately the Galaxy. And we had a chance to see uh, almost four minutes of totality in the Caribbean from that ship. One of the nice things about writing uh, in Reader's Digest 
seen by millions of people all around the world. I got a letter from a woman in South Dakota, and the woman said, I happened to be in New York the, the same year that your grandfather was in 1925 to see the total eclipse. He said, I've had this ever since, and I figure, well, it, maybe it's time to pass it along to somebody. And it, it was a filter that uh, was uh, made for the eclipse of the sun in January of 1925. And I thought that uh, rather than look through uh, my regular welder's glass or whatever, that I'd use the filter in honor of my grandfather to watch the partial phases of the eclipse. Totality for that eclipse was spectacular. Uh, Jupiter and Mercury both exploded into view during the total phase of the eclipse. And uh, this, this is a beautiful picture, but the, the best picture out of this eclipse was this one. We had taken our children, Joseph was seven, my daughter uh, Maria was four, and after the eclipse was over, my son drew this picture and gave it to me. And uh, I said, who's this guy over here? He said, that's you, Daddy. You were so happy after the eclipse was over. And this, of course, was our ship. <laughs> and, and here's the totally eclipsed sun. So to me, that was the best picture of all that came out of uh, that eclipse in 1998. 1999, another eclipse. This was in August of that year. Everybody was heading to Europe to see that eclipse. Great Britain, France, Germany. In fact, when we were uh, courting, when I was courting my uh, wife, I said way back in the uh, early 80s, I said, well, I'm going to take you to Germany. And she says, oh, really? When? I said, August 11th, 1999. That's when the next total eclipse of the sun is going to be over Europe, and uh, we'll, it'll, we'll go to Germany and see it. However, things changed between then and now, because um, about a year before, uh, I was uh, made aware of a whale watching cruise that was occurring uh, in the vicinity of Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. And the eclipse track started just south of there. And I contacted the cruise line and I told them about the eclipse. And they said, sure, come on board. We'd love to have you as our meteorologist and you can give talks on board about the eclipse to our passengers. So we didn't go to Germany. And I, in fact, I told everybody, hey, look, there's a cruise line that's leaving New York and will go into the totality path. Come on board. But a lot of people said, no, nah, I don't think so. The weather prospects were poor, usually in August in the early morning, because this is going to be right after sunrise. There's a lot of fog around Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, and the, the sun was going to be so very low. People actually, one, one guy actually said, anybody going on Joe Rayo's ship of fools? I mean, who would go? Besides that, totality would last only 50 seconds. It was going to last more than two minutes in Europe. So everybody went to Europe and nobody went on board the ship, even though I said it to everybody, come on board. Nobody, nobody or hardly anybody went. So we went on board the ship and PS, we saw a perfect total eclipse, 50 seconds of the most gorgeous totality with the sun only a couple of degrees above the horizon. It was a beautiful sight. Oh, and PS or PPS, the people, most of the people who went to Europe to see the eclipse there either got clouded or rained out. We had gone to Stuttgart in Germany, which was right in the middle of the totality path. We would have seen not a total eclipse. We would have seen pouring rain. So it's a good thing that we went on board that ship in 1999. In 2006, I went to Turkey for a total eclipse. And uh, for that, it was beautiful. Beautiful view of the sun. It gave us a kind of a double diamond ring effect, but it was it was a gorgeous sight. And uh, even though in the United States they they warn people of going to the Middle East and especially to Turkey, um, I took my chances. I I came, I went, I saw, and I came back very very happy. Now I'm not sure how many young people are watching right now. You could. Uh, probably entitled this story, Don't Be Afraid to Dream. In the aftermath of the 1979 eclipse in Montana, after our group had a celebratory dinner, Glenn Schneider and I went back to, our, to his room where we were quietly contemplating the events of earlier that day. And I asked him, so where do we go from here? And Glenn said that it was his, it was his intention to see every total solar eclipse that would take place on Earth for the remainder of his life but not, he said, to run tours. 
he said, one day I'd like to do some real science regarding either the study of the sun and or solar eclipses. And I said, wow, that's great. You know, Glenn, I'd love to write articles about solar eclipse expeditions that travel to exotic places, exotic lands, like the kind that you see in National Geographic. He said, wow. Then I said to Glenn, I wonder what the odds are for each one of us of making that happen. Oh, staggering, he said. And then for fun, I said, well, how about this one, Glenn? You end up leading a scientific expedition to view an eclipse from some out of the way place, and I end up as a writer for a publication like National Geographic or the Smithsonian and end up writing a feature article about your expedition. Yeah, well, well, that, that's, that's, that's like a million to one. But Glenn, in 2007, found a company called Air Events de Poloflug out of Germany. There was going to be in August of 2008 a total eclipse up near the North Pole. This company flies during the summertime people from Dusseldorf, Germany, all the way up to the North Pole, flies around the North Pole, and then flies back to Dusseldorf. It's 12 hours overall for the trip, but at least you can say that you flew up to the North Pole and saw the North Pole and all of the sites along the way. Glenn contacted Poloflug and said, hey, there's going to be a total eclipse of the sun a few hundred miles from the North Pole in August of 2008. How about you make some deviation and try to see that eclipse? And they said, well, we'd be fine. He, says, he said, I'll write the flight plan. Glenn was becoming very, uh, that was one of uh, Glenn's uh, uh, advocations of being able to write flight plans, flight plans to uh, interact with total solar eclipses. And so Polar Fluke said, yeah, we'll do it. We'll go. And after it was announced that Glenn had secured an aircraft to see and view the eclipse near the beginning of the eclipse path near the North Pole, Glenn was contacted by the great solar physicist and solar eclipse expert, Jay Pasikoff of Williams College in Massachusetts. Sadly, Dr. Pasikoff passed away a few months ago. But in 2008, uh, Dr. Pasikoff was going to be stationed near the end of the totality path at Aktimago Rodok, Siberia. By saying that three times fast. His experiments would deal in part with the density of plasma of the solar corona and the question as to how it was heated to millions of degrees Fahrenheit. Now he was asking Glenn if it were possible to set up an identical set of cameras on the plane so that perhaps they could collaborate and render 3D images of the solar corona. Glenn was up to the challenge and on eclipse day up front in the flight deck he had his specialized camera equipment set up on a platform stabilized by two gyroscopes. And yes, it did get through security. And this was all of the paraphernalia that he brought on board. And uh, once it was all set up, there was probably nobody happier than Glenn. But then where did I come into the story? Two weeks before the eclipse, Polar Flug approached Glenn and said, we are going to have a lot of publicity about this flight in Europe but we'd like to have some media coverage in the US as well. Might you know somebody who might be able to do that? So Glenn contacted me, and since I was and still am on the staff of the American Museum of Natural History's Hayden Planetarium, I pitched the idea of doing a story, a feature article for the museum's magazine, Natural History. Called Natural History the poor man's version of National Geographic. The stated mission of the magazine is to promote public understanding and appreciation of nature and science. Since its founding in 1900, Natural History has chronicled the major expeditions and research findings by curators at the American Museum of Natural History and other natural history museums and science centers. The publisher and the editor loved the concept. Glenn pitched it to Polar Fluke, and suddenly I found myself on board this eclipse trip. And here was my window. <laughs> this, this, of course, is the emergency hatch. And if you've ever been on a pl plane and looked at the hatch, there's a little circular three inch diameter window on board. And they told me at Polar Fluke, that will be your window for the eclipse. Now, there are people out there saying, well, how much can you possibly see or even photograph through a little thing like that? Well, trust me, you can. There it is. Um, and got some great pictures for the, of the eclipse for my uh, article for Natural History. And after we landed back in Dusseldorf, we all celebrated in front of the aircraft. And there's yours truly there, giving the thumbs up 
for our expedition up to the North Pole. And Glenn was able to get some great pictures, which he was able to uh, collaborate with Dr. Pasikoff of the Corona in their study of uh, why the uh, Corona heats up so much. I was able to uh, write my article, and it was published in the October edition of Natural History Magazine. And I, I tell you now, uh, I did not have anything to do with this, but somebody out there read the article and put it up for nomination for an award by the American Astronomical Society. And in fact, the article won the Solar Physics Division Popular Writing Award and uh, came with a very nice honorarium. And uh, I was just blown away by this. As I said, I have no clue to this day who suggested the article for, uh, for the award, but it was the climax of probably the most incredible series of events I ever had in my life. Because in retrospect, that idle conversation that Glenn and I had in 1979 ended up coming true. He's up on the flight deck with all sorts of scientific instruments photographing a solar eclipse near the North Pole. And I'm typing out my story for a highly respected journal of nature and science on a laptop computer, a device which didn't even exist in 1979. But wow, that's a dream that came true. So whenever I'm giving a talk about astronomy and I see that there are a lot of youngsters in attendance, I tell this story. The motto being, don't be afraid to dream. Dream as high as your heart tells you to fly. Seven years later, in 2015, there was another eclipse up near the polar regions. In fact, the end of totality was up near the North Pole. This was in March, on the day of the equinox, March 20th, 2015. And Glenn, once again, was in charge of, uh, with, with, with uh, the help of Polarflug, the plane company out of Dusseldorf, to arrange for uh, an eclipse flight. In fact, they had two eclipse flights, Polar Flu did, and there were others too. There were other planes in the vicinity. Glenn was in charge of all of them. He wrote flight plans for all of them, and he made sure that there wouldn't be any kind of an accident with all the planes crowded about as uh, the shadow, the oval shadow of the moon came through and on to the north and east. I uh, said to Glenn, uh, you think maybe Polar Flu might be interested in having me on board? again, like they did in 2008. He said, it wouldn't hurt to ask. So I contacted Polar Flug and I said, hi, uh, Joe Rayo, you remember me? Well, of course they knew who I was. They got tremendous publicity thanks to natural history. Oh, Mr. Rayo, Mr. Rayo, how are you? And I said, I was wondering if I might be able to come on board for the next eclipse flight you responded. Oh, of course, of course, Mr. Rayo, you're on board. P.S., you know, the, the, these flights, for those who are paying, customers on board these flights, you know, it cost anywhere from eight to $12,000 for a window seat. And uh, I'm coming on board, I came on board in 2008 for nothing. Now I'm coming on board again in 2015. But then after they said I was on board, a couple of days later, they came back and they said, excuse me, Mr. Rayo, um, we, we may have a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, well, we have two flights, as you know. He said, the flight filled with people from the States, English people, uh, that's filled up. He said, the only thing that we could do is put you on board the other, our other flight, but that's going to be filled with German people. Do, do, does it bother you? I said, of course not. I said, I'm married to a German girl. What, why? And it, eclipses transcend all languages. So I said, fine, wonderful. And so we, we ended up, you know, going on for the eclipse. Here was my boarding pass. Uh, going to a fictitious point <laughs> along the along the eclipse vent. And the best part about this was, I thought, was, you know, hearing uh, Captain Wilhelm Heinz counting down in German the final seconds before totality. Fünf, vier, drei, zwei, eine, gesamt! Totality. And everybody on that plane, be it German or English, said one word, wow. What a fantastic view of the corona. And all the way over to the left is Venus shining brightly. What a beautiful, spectacular view of totality. And then after we landed back in Dusseldorf, of course, I had to get a, a, a picture with Captain Heinz and his uh, flight uh, navigator. Uh, it, was a, it was a great time.
2016, March of 2016, we were going to have another eclipse. Most of the people going to that eclipse would be going and trying to see it from Indonesia, New Guinea, Sumatra. But I looked at this eclipse track, looked at it, and noticed that toward the end of totality, just to the north of Hawaii, and up here is Alaska. And it got my mind going again about, hmm, could we possibly replicate 1990 again? And uh, I, this time I had the internet, and it didn't take me very long to learn that Alaska Airlines had a flight going from Anchorage to Honolulu. And for that flight, it would have to be delayed by about 30 minutes. But if they did that, we'd be in line to see the total eclipse over the Pacific Ocean. Glenn got involved, wrote up a flight plan, passed it along to the folks over at uh, Alaska Air, who uh, said, this looks great. It's fantastic. We'll do it. We'll do it. And here is the view, the total eclipse path, and Alaska Airlines Flight 870, and how we were going to intercept it. Unbelievably accommodating gesture. Not only is Alaska Airlines getting people from point A to point B, but they're willing to give them an exciting flight experience. They're actually talking to their people and listening. That's what Mike Kentrianakis, Solar Eclipse Project Manager of the American Astronomical Society said, who was on board for that eclipse. He wanted to see it for himself. Here's Captain um, uh, Holm on board uh, the, the night before. We had treated uh, the flight crew to dinner. And here I am here talking uh, with him just before we got on board, showing him the latest information weather-wise about upper level winds. And here's the report that we did on News 12 about this event. Now to a News 12 special report. Not many people get the chance to see a solar eclipse from the air, but our chief meteorologist convinced a major airline to alter the path of one of its regularly scheduled flights to give passengers and crew a chance to experience an incredible celestial sight. Here's Joe Rayo's remarkable story into the eclipse. Oh my God, look at it. Here comes the shadow, look at that. It's like a tornado. Oh my God, here we go. Exclamations of wonder from a person witnessing a sight that few people in their lifetime ever get a chance to see. This is the shadow of the moon streaking silently over the Pacific Ocean at 7,000 miles per hour, about to rendezvous with a commercial jet aircraft just prior to the start of the most awe-inspiring sight the heavens can offer, a total eclipse of the sun. Totality! Totality! But it was the circumstances of how this flight came about that garnered national attention. We are about to embark on a trip that a lot of people are calling historic here. Now, a second ago, I spoke to the man who actually did this whole process a year ago. Joe Rayo noticed that this path of the eclipse was going to cross between Hawaii and Alaska. And he contacted Alaska Air to make this special flight happen. And that's how, in the dead of winter, I found myself heading to Ted Stevens International Airport in beautiful Anchorage, Alaska, on a day where the Alaskan mountains sparkled and plane tickets promised Hawaii. Waiting for me at the gate was Captain Hal Anderson of Alaska Airlines, who was going to pilot our journey into darkness. It's a rare privilege to see a total eclipse, particularly from 37,000 feet. I think Alaska Airlines should be congratulated because most other airlines just give you a, an in-flight movie. We're going to go one better than that, much better than that. We're going to give you a chance to see something you may never see again, a total solar eclipse. That's the promise I made to all the passengers as we boarded a packed 737 jet and route to Honolulu, where the in-flight entertainment began with a pair of Eclipse safety glasses. And soon, everyone on board began to get into place for the big show in the sky. The dark silhouette of the moon was about to begin crossing directly in front of the disk of the sun. First, just a small bite cutting into the bottom of the sun. And as the minutes ticked off, that bite became progressively larger and larger and larger still, cutting the sun down to a narrow crescent. In the final moments before totality, just like curtain time before a Broadway play, the light rapidly dimmed. Then, 700 miles north of Honolulu, the main event, sun, moon, plane, perfectly aligning for a perfect moment. Perfect timing, perfect timing, once in a lifetime.
time just stopped. The eclipse was frozen above us, like a phenomenal photograph pasted on the dome of the sky. The incredible corona, the crown of the sun, was now in full view. Study of this solar atmosphere is one of the main scientific benefits from an eclipse. More is being learned about the corona all the time. Some believe it may have an effect on the Earth's weather. But time was not standing still. After just 113 seconds, the moon's movement brought forth a second sunrise, ending the late afternoon darkness that had stretched across the horizon. And the passengers were still in awe. You could see that thing coming at you, you know, both sides of it, like a blanket being thrown toward your face. I have never seen one before, and it was spectacular, especially when the, the moon was totally over the sun. Spectacular and eerie at the same time. Most on board soon came to realize that for them, such an amazing sight may never come again. Proving that age-old saying is true. Why worry about your destination when the journey looks like this? Joe Rayo, News 12, airborne above the North Pacific. That was quite a sight. And I thought that after the eclipse was over, that I pretty much would have, uh, you know, uh, the end of uh, my uh, association with Alaska Airlines, but believe it or not, <clears throat> the following year for the great eclipse of 2017, and here you see all of us after the eclipse, including the flight crew <clears throat> with the big eclipse flag that um, Craig had brought. I had thought that that would be it with Alaska Airlines. I kidded them. I said that there'll be an eclipse over Alaska in 2033, and they, the head of the uh, airline said, that sounds like a plan, but a year later, they contacted me again and said, we want to be a part of the great American eclipse. And we'd like to try and uh, this time they, they planned a charter junket of press people who were going to be on board to uh, witness the eclipse. Once again, I called on Glenn. I'm happy to say that he was going great just like I, I was. <laughs> and he wrote up a flight plan for Alaska Airlines where they would come out of Portland. We were the first people, I presume, of the millions who saw the 2017 eclipse because we were offshore way away, a thousand miles away from the coast. And so the shadow would interact with us first before it would interact with anybody else on land. And as far as I was concerned, my goodness, I was kind of like the, the go-to guy with the press both nationally and internationally, people, you know, asking questions and uh, my, you know, taking them from this podium here, you could, it, was a, it was an amazing thing. Here are our, uh, once again, pilots, um, Captain Anderson on the right and uh, Brian Holm on the, on the left. Here I was giving a blow by blow, both over the intercom system of the plane and also even at my seat, they gave me a seat with two windows. That was very nice of them. <laughs> and we saw it. We saw totality. Here's my view of looking through seven by 35 binoculars out the window. These two things, by the way, are my wife's kitchen timers, which I use to time second and third contact. And here's a view uh, taken by a friend of mine from the ground. This dot over here, that's Regulus in the constellation of Leo the Lion. This view was taken by my um, college uh, professor in atmospheric science, who I invited on board the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the flight, Stan Getzelman. This view that he took shows you the elliptical shape of the shadow projected on the clouds that were below us over the Pacific. These two people, very near and dear to me, they are Glenn's parents. Glenn Schneider decided he was gonna stay on the ground and watch the eclipse from Madras, Oregon, but he did say that for charting out the flight path for this particular venture, he said, I'd like very much if you would allow my parents to come on board. Sure enough, they did, they were there. I grew up with these people, Elaine Schneider on the right, Irish Schneider on the left. I used to go to Glenn's house. Glenn used to come to my house. 
So having them on board was really a wonderful experience. But even more wonderful than that was having my own family, my wife, my son, my daughter, Maria, and uh, this guy in the back making the thumbs up. I thought that that was going to be my last total eclipse until 2024. But then in the summer of 2021, I was contacted by uh, a company called Ponant. They had a cruise that was going to see the Antarctic solar eclipse that occurred in December of 2021. Most of the people on board their cruise ship were French, but there were a lot of English speaking people. And uh, they, they said, we understand from the American Astronomy Astronomical Society that you're very well versed in communications and talking with people. And we'd like to know if you'd be interested in coming on board for our Antarctic cruise. Do you know what I said? No. I said, no. It was a two week cruise to Antarctica. And I, I said, there's like a 90% chance you're going to be clouded out. I said, I, did, you know, I'm, I, I haven't been clouded out since Columbia. I'm not going to go on. Next day, I get this email from the head of the AAS. Uh, uh, he says, what are you nuts? What are you crazy? He said, think of it in the broad picture. The eclipse will be the icing on the cake, but the cake is the blankety blank cruise. How could you turn it down? Well, I changed my mind and uh, Renata and I did go. Here, as predicted, was totality under cloudy skies. It actually snowed a little bit just after totality ended. So we, we blew totality, but hey, what, what other time in my life am I gonna be able to share an experience with 200,000 penguins on Paulette Island? And of course, Renata and I, you know, all bundled up uh, uh, against the cold down in Antarctica. And you can see my eclipse patch on, uh, on my parka over there. So many people have gotten me to where I am today, but all of us have had special ones, I'm sure, who have loved us into being. People who have helped you become who you are. Those who have cared about you and those who wanted what was best for you in life. For me, this gentleman 60 years ago opened the door. And uh, from that moment on, uh, my life changed and uh, got me involved in science, astronomy, and eclipses. So for all of you who are planning to go in uh, 20, 16 months, I hope that you have clear weather, great skies, and uh, I hope that uh, you enjoyed this. It, it went a little longer than I anticipated, but I hope you enjoyed it, got something out of it, and I thank all of you for coming this evening to hear me talk about uh, the adventures of this eclipse chaser. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. We have any questions from anybody? Joe, I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Um, the flight in 1990, there was a lot of people on the L-1011. Was there a mad rush scramble for people to get to the windows on the, uh, the one side of the plane? Yes, we had... Uh... We had, um, maybe I would say it was like two or in some cases three deep in the aisles, everybody looking straight out uh, across into the, but there were some people also who had no interest in the eclipse whatsoever. In fact, prior to totality, um, they were showing a movie, Driving Miss Daisy. And uh, every time one of us opened the window or the shade to look out at the rapidly diminishing sun, the light would fall on the screen and people looked annoyed because they wanted to watch the movie. Fortunately, the movie ended just before totality. Sam Storch, who was one of, uh, one of us on board, uh, later said, uh, I don't know where they were driving her. I don't care where they were driving her, but I'm just glad that they got Miss Daisy where she was supposed to go in time for the total phase of the eclipse. <laughs> uh, anybody else got a question? Uh, yeah, I do. Can I share my screen a second? You go ahead. Okay. Can everyone see that? Yep. Okay. Well, I've been on several eclipses so far. This is my itinerary. First one was in 1991. That was actually with skyscrapers, I remember, and it was clouded out. And uh, and then the, so my I have 11 total solar eclipses. And three were clouded out, so I was seventy-five percent. Three annular, all of them I've seen, and I traveled to Greece and Hawaii to see both transits of Venus in their entirety. So, 
<laughs> but eclipses are really something. And I have all of the videos I took of totality on YouTube. Just put my name, Greg Seamus, solar eclipses, and they'll all come up <laughs> and you can see them. I'll be looking. <laughs> You're welcome. By the, way, by the way, I have no interest in annular eclipses. People have been asking me if I'm going to go to the annular next Oh, October. really? Yeah. Uh, it, it, it was this, they're still good. I, I mean, you know, first one I actually saw was an annular because uh, the totality was clouded out. So I saw the annular in 94. And then once I saw the, the one in Bolivia, that, that was my first one. So, and, and like you said, the traveling is, is amazing. I mean, you've been to Bolivia, I've been to Mongolia, I've been to Aruba, I've been to Africa, I've been to Australia. South Pacific, Madrid, Spain. I've been to China a few times, you know, Easter Island. That was a good one. And then these were in, uh, in the United States. So it, it's, it, it's really a, my wife loves the traveling part of it too. She liked the eclipses, but she loves the traveling. If part. you can, if you can afford it, that's, that's great. I, uh, yeah, I, yeah you, but okay. things were, um, a lot cheaper back then. I mean, it's not like it is now. I mean, now they get, they've they gotten really astronomical, if you pardon the fun, <laughs> you know, the prices. Well, you know, the, uh, the the one I saw in Turkey was a, was a hands down. I, I, somebody told me that there was a, a travel agency called Cosmos Travel that was offering yeah. people in, in London, in, in the UK, a quickie flight down to Turkey to see the eclipse. And then within another day or so, you'd get back on the plane and go back. Cost The total cost of the of the tour was $500. So all it cost for me was to find a, an airline that would get me to London, which I did. I found Air India for like $495. So then it was like $1,000 for me. And then another $500 for uh, a hotel for a couple of days and for traveling around uh around it. The funniest thing about, you talk about annular eclipses, yeah. on the flight down from London to Turkey, yeah. a gentleman caught sight of the fact I have an eclipse hat and I have badges all over the hat of all the eclipses that I have seen. So he comes up to me and he says, excuse me, governor. And by the way, they really do talk like that. Excuse me, mate. Excuse me. I said, yes. What, what can I do for you? He said, I understand you see a lot of total eclipses. And I said, yes, I have. He said, six months ago, I was in Madrid for the Ring of Fire. And indeed, there was an annular eclipse over, yeah, I over, saw that over, one. Yeah. over Madrid. And uh, I said, yeah. He said, he said now nah, I'd ask you a question. He says, is what we're going to see tomorrow in Turkey, total eclipse of the sun, will that be as good as the Ring of Fire that I saw in Madrid? And I looked at him and I almost laughed in his face. I said, Mr. You ain't seen nothing yet. Nothing yet. Forget about it. It's, I said, this is that. True. And he looked at me and he said, really? He said, well, I, I thought it was I thought it was a great, great event. He said, a ripping good show. And I said, look, <laughs> you're going to be on the same flight coming back tomorrow night, right? He says, yes. He said, you come back over to me and you tell me how you think what we're going to see tomorrow stacks up with your ring of fire. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. sure enough, he came back almost like, like, like looking like this. And I said, so <laughs> how'd you like the ring of fire compared to what you saw today with the total eclipse? And he said, well, the ring of fire was cute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you, can, you can you he see my screen? Can you see my screen? He about that. Can you see my screen? I yep. get a screen. Yeah, I see it. Okay. Here's my first reaction to the eclipse. Honey, look at that. Oh my God, look at it. Woo! Woo! Oh my God! Can you hear oh, it? That's gorgeous. Oh my God. Keep clicking, yeah. Keep Take clicking, it honey. Down. It's totally dark. Oh, wow. Well, I'm turning up the gain here quite a bit to expose the corona. Now that's, uh, that's high. Wow, oh my God, look at that. Oh my God! <laughs> oh my God! Honey, look at it from the camera. Look at that! Oh my God! Keep clicking, click! Keep 
Kill it. <laughs> my God, you can see two. Oh my God, look at that. Oh, that's my first. That track. is beautiful. Oh my God, I've never seen that before. Oh my God, it's so dark. So you can it's too low, <sighs> Just. Oh my sounds, God. It sounds like you're having sex. <laughs> I know. Look at that. Anyone have a cigarette? Look at that Corona. Wow! I know. That was my first reaction. <laughs> it, it's amazing. That's how. That's how right. exciting. I don't think, we, could, I don't think we, we we have the time to see all four minutes, but I I think you got your yeah. message across. Yeah. Well, yeah I think Thanks. you got the message. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, if we Everyone don't have any more. <laughs> We don't have any more. We'll call an end to this wonderful night. How many did you see, Joe? Total. I've seen thirteen. I've been in to thirteen totals. I've been okay. clouded out of two: the one in Colombia, and the one last year in Antarctica, which I knew was going you, to be yeah, yeah, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't have any. I mean, even though I worked with the captain to try to find a spot where it might be clear, it was no way. That it was just a solid overcast. Yeah. And P.S. Uh, it was an eclipse at, at sunrise. It was uh, like at four o'clock in the morning. Guess what? Wow. When the sun set that evening at like 11 o'clock, perfectly clear, beautiful sky, sunset. Wow. I said, well, it could be a sunset eclipse and not a yeah. sunset eclipse. But I yeah, think, those, I did, those Antarctic funny. eclipses, they want like 20,000 starting and up per person. I mean, I'd rather purchase an automobile for that price. You know? Well, I and, and my, I don't. I, I try my best at eclipses. I try not to have to pay. Um, yeah, yeah. I know. I, 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 I'm I, not that a fortunate. Of, a lot of eclipses. You know what really opens the door for me is my affiliation with the Museum of Natural History. If I if I alert um, a, a, a cruise line or a travel agency and say, "Hey, I I work with the American Museum. I'm, a, I'm an associate astronomer at the Hayden Planetarium." That yeah. And that's an example with Alaska Airlines. Instead of hanging up on me and saying, thanks a lot, we're not interested, boom, that opened the door and say, all right, tell us a little bit more about this. And that opens the door and that gets me uh, on uh, for, uh, for sometimes a freebie. Good, yeah. <laughs> and that's the way, that's the only way to fly. <laughs> that's the idea, yeah. Hey, Linda? I have somebody else with a question, Eileen? Yes, yep. I have a question, I have a, thank I have you. I have a question I'd like to ask Joe. Wait a minute, let's Eileen go first, please. Uh, my question is, can, if you have a friend who has a, a their own propeller aircraft, can, is it hard to see an eclipse that way? A lot of people figured that they were going to see the eclipse from an aircraft for 2017. And a lot of people made plans to be in the zone of totality. The problem which they discovered was, that across the United States in 2017, if you try to look out the window, the sun wasn't available straight out ahead of you. It was up there. It was uh, the, the, the most windows of an airline, the highest you can go with the sun is 30 degrees. At uh, the Oregon coast, the sun was already 45 degrees up. You would have literally have had to got, get on the floor and stare up, up again, put your face up against the window to see the sun. Um, in fact, that's what Alaska Airlines was planning to do. They planned to fly right off the Oregon coast with the uh, with their media people, show them the eclipse, and then come right back. And Glenn pointed out to them and said, "You can't do that." Well, why can't we do that? He said, "The sun is going to be way up, up, up there." He said, do you, "Can you take the can you take the seats out and let, let everybody lay on their stomach and look up through the plane?" No, of course not. How about banking the plane about fifteen degrees? No, that's a dangerous thing. It's a safety regulation. He said, well, there's only one other way that you're going to be able to do this. And he said, you'll have to fly until the sun is like in the middle of the window. Oh, how far out is that? And that was a thousand miles. They only wanted to go a hundred. They would have had to go a thousand miles to see that. We told them that. And they said, oh, well, thank you very much. And hung up. And I said to Glenn, that's it. We're, we're, they're not doing this. He said, can you imagine all the air the, the fuel that they're going to have to expend is going to be tremendously expensive for them. They're not going to do it. But P.S., the next day they called back and said, okay, we'll do it. <laughs> and they wanted, that, they wanted that publicity like they got with the first flight in 2016, and they got that publicity again in 2017 with the Great American Eclipse. 
I have another yeah. question, Ed Walsh. All right, Linda, yeah, I just wanted to make the announcement about next month's meeting. Great. Okay, uh, Eric Hintz will be, uh, who is with the American Association of Variable Star Observers. Uh, he specializes in short period pulsating stars, and that's what he'll be talking to us uh, about in February. And in particular, he'll be addressing the contributions that can be made uh, by amateur astronomers that have been made and can be made uh, by those of us who might be interested. Thank you. All righty. And Bobby Napier. <laughs> uh, Joe, there was a total eclipse uh, that went across Nantucket, I think, in uh, 1971. 70. 70. Did you see March, that? March 7. No, that was the eclipse that my grandfather and I were planning to see, but was uh, put on hold or was postponed because of his uh, operation to get his uh, voice box removed. We had, we were, that was the eclipse we were planning that he had promised he was going to take me to uh, from 1963. But again, we couldn't because he had to undergo that operation the day before that eclipse. So I had to stay in New York and saw a 96% of uh, totality uh, from that. Well, I uh, flew over to Nantucket uh, with a friend uh, who was a professional photographer, member of Skyscrapers uh, back then and uh, couldn't get into the airport at nine, Nantucket. Uh, so we had uh, a bunch of airplanes were landing in fields and uh, one of the airline airplanes uh, unfortunately hit a dish and it nosed over uh, in the ditch. I don't think anyone was hurt, uh, but it became a very crowded event with all the airplanes trying to get in to land to see the totality. But right. anyway, we, uh, we landed safely in the field and we have a, a very good uh, professionally made, um, well, my friend and I, uh, 16 millimeter film yeah. of that total eclipse. The, at Stella Payne, maybe about 20 years ago, well, probably not more than 20 years ago, at uh, one of the uh, Friday night talks, somebody had uh, shown a movie that he took of that eclipse, and he said exactly what you said, that he was uh, refused landing privileges at uh, Nantucket Airport because Nantucket was just jam-packed with so many planes trying to land there. And so he did a once around the island, he saw some wide open beach front and he said, the heck with this. And he flew down and he landed on the beach. And as soon as he was getting out of the plane, he turned around, and he saw about five or six other planes coming down right behind him. And that basically is what you just said is basically what he, what he said with that, with that event. Okay. I, I, can I say something, Linda? Oh, no, sure. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, You'll same. be the last question. Okay, the same eclipse, this is just a memory, the same eclipse. Um, we flew from Worcester, Mass. to uh, Nantucket, three of us. And we were the very last airplane to land on the tarmac at Nantucket Airport. As a matter of fact, the uh, runway lights came on as we were landing and off the port side of the airplane, we could see totality. We never got to take out any equipment, but we saw the total eclipse from the airplane. Then we waited five hours to be able to take off from Nantucket Airport because there were so many planes ahead of us to get out of there. Yeah. All righty. Well, thank you, Joe. It was a wonderful, inspiring talk. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy I was finally able to give this talk instead of last October, but I'm finally happy that we were able to do it tonight. Yeah, thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. All righty. Have a good one. All right. You too. Thank, thank you. you.